الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته And it is wonderful to see these bright faces before us I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to encompass us with his mercy and his forgiveness my brothers and sisters in Islam, last week we completed our series, the end series, about the hereafter. And what I thought of doing is to conclude the session with another conclusion. To conclude it with some rulings in Islam on the rules of funerals and death. We live in a time where a lot of this knowledge has been lost and a lot of people have mixed culture and traditions other than the traditions of Islam. And some people don't know what to do. At the time when somebody is sick or when they are dying or when they are dead and after their death, how to bury them how to visit them, how you can still benefit the dead person when they have died, especially if they are related to you. What benefit can they still receive from you? What can you do? What should you do? What are their rights when they are dead? And what are their rights when they were sick? What are the rules of paying condolences to the family? What do you say? What should you say? What should you do at these different moments? And personally, I have been invited to many uh, occasions when a person is dying in the hospital. And they ask for an imam or a learned person to come along when their father or their brother or their mother or someone is dying in the hospital. And this is because many families don't know what to do at that time. Whereas our deen has come and explained everything for us, for everybody. Calling an imam to learn is good, it's okay, but every single Muslim should try their best to learn their deen even at these moments. For these moments are actually, at the time of death, these moments are extremely critical for the family to know what to do and how to do it. Some families have even gone to do things that are not from the Islamic way as the Prophet ﷺ taught us. And some of them fall into haram. And they also fall into matters that make or that associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people fall into matters that are actually made up. We call these innovations in the religion. Only the religion of Islam, we are not allowed to innovate, make new ideas or laws into this religion and make it as though it is part of it. Everything else you can innovate. And Islam encourages us to innovate in life, in technology, in teaching methods, and all such things. However, in the religion itself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent us this final messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with this great and vast explanation of this deen. So that even the way we eat, the way we drink, the way we bathe, the way we get married, even to the point of the secrets between the intimacy of couples, Islam has taught us in detail and with examples. And most of all, we need to talk about this knowledge which is forgotten or lost by a lot of people is the ruling of what we call in, in, in the Sharia terms or in Islamic terms, janais, funerals, dying and death. And this religion, Islam, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has come to us for the benefit of the humans and the benefit of the jinns and the benefit of all life. When you are living, when you are dying and when you're dead. And so 
there are obligations upon us for the sick and the dead person. Such as visiting the person when they are ill, especially at their deathbed. You don't know if it's their deathbed, but we're talking about severe illnesses that normally cause death. To the rights of the dead person, what we should say and do when they are dying. To the way we should prepare them for their grave and to how we should bury them and stand around them. To paying off any debts that the dead person has left behind. To carrying out their will that they have also left behind. To look after their property that have left behind and distribute it among his, his or her family in accordance with the inheritance rules of the Quran and the Sunnah. To guard the children and take guardianship of them if no one else is there or who else of the family. To seek forgiveness from people whom you know they have wronged or they have rights with and to return their belongings on their behalf. Also even their religion. If there are certain fara'id, uh, compulsory acts that they have not been able to do, you can do them on their behalf. Especially if you are family. What can you do on their behalf? What should you do on their behalf? So these are all very important. Us as a community, as a, as a nation, as an ummah, that even at the time of death, there are these extraordinary rights. Imam Ibn al-Qayyim, rahmatullahi alayh, one of the great scholars of our past, he said, Rahimahullah about the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam وَكَانَ هَدْيُهُ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ فِي الْجَنَائِزِ أَكْمَلَ الْهَدِي مُخَالِفًا لِهَدْيِ سَائِرِ الْأُمَمْ He said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's guidance in the times of funerals and death and dying has come to us in the most complete form different to the rest of the nations who had ever come before all the nations of all the prophets that came before, none had such detailed explanation and comprehensive descriptions about funeral, dying and death as, the, as the, our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu came to us with as the final messenger to all of humanity, to all of the world and the jinns. To even how to make dua, what to recite and so on and so forth. In the beginning, the Prophet Sallallahu began by advising us the living. What does he advise the living? You will find that the advice to the living normally constitutes hope, but they concentrate on the fear as well. What is the fear? Not really fear as in scared, but more a warning, a preparation. And you will find the Prophet Sallallahu in several circumstances, situations, he would remind the people to remember death. Remember death. He used to say, مُرُّ عَلَى الْقُبُورِ وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّهَا سَتَكُونُ لَكُمْ مَسَاكِنْ Go past the graveyards, go to the cemetery, visit the cemetery. For it reminds you of the hereafter. This is actually a mercy from the Prophet Sallallahu to us not something frightening. It is natural that a person is afraid of death. But for a believer, they use this fear and they use this reminder as a motivation, as a reminder to prepare ourselves for the hereafter, to keep us living with the hereafter in the back of our mind so that we don't get deluded and lost in the matters of the world, of the dunya. And oh, how extremely magnetizing the dunya can be to a person. Wallahi, it can take over their whole mind, it'll take over the whole body, it can take over their whole heart until a person no longer knows who they are anymore. Because Allah says in the Quran about those who follow it and let it consume them, Allah gives an example of them in the Quran saying, نَسُوا اللَّهَ فَأَنْسَاهُمْ أَنفُسَهُمْ 
When they forgot Allah, they forgot themselves. When they forgot Allah, they forgot who they even are. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying here. If there had come a point in your life where you know of somebody, where they just no longer know who they are anymore, and why they're here, what is their purpose, where are they going? So Allah tells us to remember the hereafter by remembering Allah, otherwise you'll forget who you are. نَصُوا اللَّهَ فَأَنْسَاهُمْ أَنفُسَهُمْ They forgot Allah, so Allah made them forget themselves. In the way Allah has created the world, you forget Allah, then by that you'll forget yourself. And he said, صلى الله عليه وسلم, أَكْثِرُوا مِنْ ذِكْرِ هَاذِمِ اللَّذَّاتِ Try to, try to mention a lot and remind each other a lot about the destroyer of all desires, the destroyer of all luxuries. This is how the Prophet ﷺ described death. This is the name he gave it. He called it Hadim al the destroyer, the eraser of desires and luxuries. You see, a person who is dying, they don't take anything with them. It's breathing. We would give up the whole world for our breathing, wouldn't we? Yes, we would. And that person at the time of death would give up everything so that they can live another minute, another hour. Allah says this in the Quran that when death comes to them, those who have neglected their duties to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. قَالَ رَبِّ رجعون. He will say, O oh my Lord, return me. أَعْمَلُ صَالِحًا غَيْرَ الَّذِي كُنَّ أَعْمَلُ رَبِّ رجعون. O oh my Lord, return me. I don't recall the rest of the ayah, but, what, but I do recall its meaning. And that is so that I may fix up and catch up what I have lost, what I delayed. But Allah says in the Qur'an, وَلَنْ يُؤَخِّرَ اللَّهُ نَفْسًا إِذَا جَاءَ أَجَلُهَا Allah will never delay a single person's life once its time has come. So, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us, remember it all the time before the time of death comes. And this hadith is narrated, narrated by all five books of hadith. In a turmudhi عن عبد ابن مسعود رضي الله عبد الله ابن مسعود رضي الله عنه he says that about the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم that he said استحيوا من الله حق الحياء be ashamed of your lord or be ashamed sorry be shy before your lord not ashamed be shy before your lord in the true form that you must be shy from him he said, we asked the Messenger of Allah, Ya Rasulullah, we are already shy from our Lord and Alhamdulillah for that. But the Prophet ﷺ replied and he said, Laysa dhak, walakinna al-istihya'a min Allahi haqqa al-hayya' an tahfad al-ra'sa wa ma wa'a wa al-batna wa ma hawa wa tathakkar, wa tathakkar al-mawta wa al-bala وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةَ تَرَكَ زِينَةَ الدُّنْيَا فَمَنْ فَعَلَ ذَلِكَ فَقَدْ اسْتَحْيَ مِنَ اللَّهِ حَقَّ الْحَيَاءِ Which means, he said, this is not the type of shyness I'm telling you about, to be shy in front of Allah. I am telling you that to be truthfully shy from your Lord is that you guard your head, your mind, your head and your brain and everything that's in the head, the eyes and the ears and the mouth and all of that and your brain, to guard it from the bad and whatever it can carry inside your brain. Guard it from all the bad. وَالْبَطْنَ وَمَا حَوَىٰ And your stomach and what it can contain. Guard it from the haram. And remembering death and times of hardship that can possibly come. Meaning the time in the hereafter. Or the hardships and sicknesses in this world. Remember that they can come at any time. So be ashamed of your Lord now. Be shy from your Lord right now before these times come. And he said, and whoever wants the goodness of the hereafter, he or she will try their best 
to avoid the extreme luxuries of this world. Whoever does so, he said, then he is truly shy from their Lord in the truthful way they are meant, they are meant to be shy. I mean, who can control you what you're going to look at or what you hear or what you speak or what you learn? Who can control you what you eat and what you put into the stomach and what you remind yourself of? Who? So when you are ashamed of yourself and you are shy before your Lord, in these moments, what do you do? You stop because you know Allah is seeing you. So remembering this is what the Prophet ﷺ is telling us about. A person before they die, my dear brothers and sisters, normally, normally, or generally speaking, it is known that a person becomes ill, very ill before they die. Majority of the time, this is the common motto that we know. However, Rasul ﷺ told us that in times before the last hour, there will be something called Mawt al sudden death. Sudden death, where a person has no warning before death. And these are some people they wish if they can die without feeling anything. Just die and not feel anything. Uh, when you look at the lives of the prophets, you'll find that a lot of them were ill before they died. And illness, sickness in Islam is actually a mercy. A person dying suddenly... It's also from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, depending on how they died. However, the mercy of illness before death is even better. Why? In, in, in just normal cases. Because a person begins to ask for forgiveness, contemplates, reflects upon their sins, reflects upon their actions. Subhanallah, you go to any sick person. I went and visited a sick person the other day, sick in body, of course, inshallah, not in heart. And he said to me, now this person had left, he wasn't praying, you see. Probably going to Jummah every now and then, that's about it. Indulging in just luxuries of life. When he became ill, I was shocked to hear him even more contemplating about the hereafter than I am. And the depth of his contemplation was deeper than my thought in his health. And I remember at times when I am sick, or when you are sick, you begin to contemplate more. Because there are less distractions and more focus. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives you in those times. And therefore at the time when we visit the sick person, especially a person who is given the news that there's a possibility or probability of death resulting from this according to past experiences, we should try and be positive. The sunnah of the Prophet is that we are positive. When a person is living and they're in good health, we make them aware of the negatives. Or we make them, well, in Islam, every negative is positive for us anyway. Every suffering is a good thing for us. But what I mean by that is that we make them aware of the hardships and when time runs out. But when they are ill or sick, at these moments we are positive with them. We remind them of the mercy of Allah. Because at that moment, they are already experiencing the hardship. You don't need to remind them of it. You don't need to make it worse upon them. A Muslim is merciful to another Muslim. So a person who's lost his money, for example, or his wealth, you don't come and sort of, you know, rub it in. You don't rub it in in all the shapes or forms by showing off what you have. You know, when I was a child, children used to be, some, some of them were very cruel. They used to say to them, uh, you can't afford it. Your parents can't afford this or can't afford that. This is cruel. In Islam, we don't have that. So a person who is ill or sick, especially the time of death, you do not try to be negative. Try to be as positive as, as possible. And there is so many things we can be positive about. Our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for example, said, when he was ill and Abdullah, the son of Abu Bakr, anhu, entered, or was it Ibn Abbas, one of them entered, and he said to him, Ya Rasul Allah, atu'aku wa'kan shadida. Are you actually experiencing severe hardship at the moment? Pain? He said, Inni la u'aku kama yu'aku rajulani min rijalikum. I go through the pain, the suffering of, of illness, twice as what double of you men would go through. He said to him, Adalika anna laka la ajrain. Does that mean that you have double the reward? Qala ajal. He said, Yes. Dalika ma min imru'in muslim in tusibuhu adan shawkatan illa kafar Allahu biha sayyati. There isn't a single believer on the face of the earth, that if the prick of a needle were to harm them, 
Allah would compensate them by forgiving their sins or giving them rewards. There is always a compensation. For Rasul Sallallahu is more deserving, not of compensation, but of more rewards than all of us for his struggle Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But obviously, a mu'min does not feel the pain of death itself, meaning when the soul escapes. But the, ag- or the, the pain of sickness, yes. The pain of illness, yes. Bodily pain on the outside, in his dunya. Even the prophets, yes. And this is good. Rasul Sallallahu said, عَجَبًا لِأَمْرِ الْمُؤْمِنِ Strange. Wallahi, strange. He used to say, strange to me is the matter of the true believer. In أَصَابَهُ خَيْرٌ شَكَرٌ If a good thing happens to him or her, they thank Allah. They don't boast. They don't show off. Right? They don't become arrogant. They just say, Alhamdulillah, and they remember that Allah is the one who gave it to them. وَإِنْ أَصَابَهُ وَإِنْ أَصَابَتْهُ ضَرَّاءَ صَبَرٌ and when something harmful occurs to him or her, you find that they persevere. They are patient. They don't swear. They don't blame Allah. They don't neglect their duties. They don't start to question their Lord, blame this person, lose their temper, and so on and so forth. They use it over time for, forgive- for asking forgiveness, dua, and so on and so forth. And the Sahabas of the Prophet ﷺ used to interpret the verses in the Quran, the verse in the Quran, فَفِرُّوا إِلَى اللَّهِ Run away to Allah. Run away to Allah. They used to interpret it in their life. Every time they had the opportunity, they would always try to run away from the losthood of this world to the security of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Time of sicknesses and illnesses, they doubled their worship, they doubled their remembrance. Another thing to know, is that there is nothing wrong with complaining to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the time of illness. Complain to Allah, it does not negate your patience. Some people they say to me, I don't want to complain. If I complain to my Lord about my sickness, it's as if I'm going against my Lord's decree. No, this is not necessarily true. It depends how you complain. If you are complaining in the form of uh, blame, blaming, or you know, nagging in a negative way, then that's, that's wrong. But complaining to Allah like this, Allahumma inni ashku ilayka da'fa quwwati, as the Prophet ﷺ used to say to Allah, O oh Allah, I complain only to you the weakness of myself, the weakness of my body, the weakness of my heart. Or the, as Ayyub ﷺ used to say, قَالَ رَبِّ مَسَّنِيَ الضُّرُّ وَأَنْتَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ O oh my Lord, harm has afflicted me and you are the most merciful, the giver of mercy to specific people as well. So this is the way you complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah loves your complaint. Why? The complaining to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in, in obviously with manners and etiquettes, as the prophets used to do it, is a form of you acknowledging that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there for you. فَفِرُّوا إِلَى Allah, Run away to the security of Allah. And one of those ways is to say, O oh Allah, I complain only to you, my worries and my hardship. For, for harm does not come from Allah. And if harm does happen to a, if something suffering happens to a person, for, to a mu'min, that suffering in itself, we only take it in a good way. And therefore we run away to Allah in this suffering and say, Oh my Lord, forgive me in my suffering. Oh my Lord, assist me in my suffering. Oh my Lord, I complain to you my weakness and so on and so forth. Another thing to know is to use medicine even when they say to you, There's no need to use medicine, put your trust in Allah or you have no hope. A mu'min should use the reasons that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created on earth for us. And the Prophet said, لِكُلِّ دَاءٍ دَوَاءٍ For every sickness there is a cure. لِكُلِّ دَاءٍ دَوَاءٍ For every illness there is a cure. Except for two things. Al-haram wal-maut. Old age, there's no cure to old age. No matter what they try. And there is no cure to death. You cannot bring a person back to life anymore. There is no cure that Allah has created on earth for that. But everything else is. And Rasul Sallallahu said, فَإِنْ أَصَابَ الدَّاءُ الدَّوَاءُ فَإِنْ أَصَابَ الدَّوَاءُ الدَّاءُ بَرِئَ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ When the medicine is struck and it's the right medicine for the sickness, then the sick person will become cured. And what to say to a sick person as well of good words is to say to them the following, such as the following, as the Prophet ﷺ used to say, لا بأس طهور إن شاء الله Don't worry, don't worry. This is a purification in شاء الله. Sometimes he used to say to the ill people, especially really ill people, 
Sometimes he would say, um, he would say a cure. This is a cure. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't say insha'Allah at times. So he would tell you it is a cure. Without even saying the word insha'Allah. This means that to give them as though you are saying it definitely. But it's not about knowing the future. It's just something that you give the, de the, the ill person hope in. So when you say to him or her, this is a cure. Obviously you know you are saying insha'Allah. This is in your heart. But just in front of them, sometimes a very ill person insha'Allah you know, it's not saying to them, this is a cure, gives them a little bit more hope. And today, the doctors tell us, research tell us in some research that half of the healing process, half of the healing process is the mental state of the ill person. When, you, when, when they are stress-free, it helps them in curing. One thing to remember, however, it is haram to seek things which Allah has made haram as medicine, such as alcohol. One of the important things for a person to do, whether they are dying or not, is to always update, always update your will. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَا حَقُّ امْرِئٍ مسلم له شيء يوصي به يبيت ليلتين إلا ووصيته مكتوبة عنده. He said, it is not right for any Muslim, or it is a must for every Muslim that if there is something you need to leave as a will, if you die the next day or you die immediately or later on, something you need to inform the people about, such as a debt or some kind of other will, then the Prophet ﷺ said, do not let two nights pass before you update it. Two nights. So every Muslim must look at their will and update it every two nights, especially if there is something that they must leave behind, must inform. He said, don't delay it more than two nights. Or inform someone to remind you. For there is a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that a man... A companion of the Prophet ﷺ died. And it was the habit of the Prophet ﷺ that when someone dies, he used to ask if he has or she has a debt upon them. Debts owing to people. And if they say, yes they, yes, they had a debt, and obviously this person was able, was able to pay the debt, and they didn't, or they didn't inform someone to carry it on their behalf, such as a will, and they did have someone to do so, but especially if they had the ability and they didn't pay that debt, Rasul Sallallahu used to say, pray on your brother. And he used to walk away. So the companions would pray on him. Prophet Sallallahu would tell him pray, obviously because he's still a mu'min. But he wouldn't pray, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Something special, significant to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this man, he died and he said, A'ala akhikum daynan? Does your brother have a debt which he was owing and didn't pay. They said, yes, Ya Rasulullah, he had 10 dananir, 10 dinars, in those days' currencies. A small amount, yani. He said, sallu ala akhikum, pray upon your brother. And he was about to walk away when one companion said, Ya Rasulullah, please, pray on him, and I will carry the responsibility of fulfilling his debt. So the Prophet ﷺ prayed, and one week later, or the next day, the next day he said, أَقَضَيْتَ عَنْ أَخِيكَ دَيْنَ Have you fulfilled his debt? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I got busy in the time. and He said, after a week he asked him again, أَقَضَيْتَ عَنْ أَخِيكَ دَيْنَ Have you done it? He said, الآن يا رسول الله, I did now. And the Prophet ﷺ replied the following words for this man. الآن بردت عليه جلدته Now his skin has cooled down. Now his skin has cooled down. This is a Sahih Hadith. Now, this is a person who is able to pay or did not leave a will behind them when they were healthy and had the ability to do so. However, there are other hadiths in our sunnah where if a person had the will to pay but they didn't have any money to pay and they left a will and they still didn't have money to pay then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
will forgive them and fulfill their debt on their behalf. So the person who they're owing it to, Allah will actually make a way for that person who is still living to compensate them. And you think, where did this risk come from? Maybe a mu'min, you had given, you helped help the mu'min by lending him or her money or wealth or anything or a property of some sort. And that person was, able, was not able to pay it and they wanted to pay it. And the family can't find any wealth left behind to pay it to you. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala compensates you himself. And this is a reward to both of you. The mu'min who has died and you who has helped a mu'min. There is great reward from helping a mu'min even after their death that comes back to you. And there is an ayah in the Qur'an, a few ayat in the Qur'an, Surah Al-Kahf, that when Musa alayhi salam al-Khadr, you know the story of al-Khadr and Musa, right? Well, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him that there is a man, ya Musa, that we have taught pieces of knowledge that you don't know. And he went to him and he took him on a journey. And on that journey, he saw this man, Al-Khadr, do things that were unbelievable, out of the ordinary. Things that Musa questioned a lot, and he had promised not to question. So he questioned the first one, questioned the second one, and he said, if I ask you again on the third one, that's it, I don't have the right to walk with you or learn anything from you. Musa is learning from Al-Khadr about these matters. When they reached the third one, he entered a village, and this village, now Al Musa and Al Khadr were very hungry. They were very hungry, very tired. They wanted a place to sleep, they wanted to play, something to eat. And these people of the village were extremely rude and cruel to them. They kicked them out. They said, We've got nothing for you, get out of here. So on their way out, they saw a group of these village people who had been cruel to them trying to um, lift up a wall or fix a wall. So Al Khadr went and helped them. He helped the cruel people. And Musa salam, questioned him for the last time. He said, if you want, you could have taken some ajr. Just ask him for a reward at least, because we're hungry. Get some money or some wealth or get some food at least for helping them. He said, that's it. No more friendship or no more companionship with me and you. I'll tell you what this means. This wall belonged to two orphans. And, these, and underneath that wall there was a treasure. And the village people didn't know there was a treasure. If they known that there was a treasure, they would have stolen the treasure from the orphans. See how cruel they were? So I wanted to help them to lift the wall so that when the orphans grow up and become adults, they are able to take the treasure and no one can take it from them. They can protect themselves, defend themselves. This is a mercy from your Lord for them. In the hadith of the Prophet it explained to us why. These orphans, it says that their seventh great-grandfather, seventh, backwards, great-grandfather, was... And Al-Khadr says, وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا Their father was a righteous man. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says it was their seventh great-grandfather. In Arabic you say father to grandfather as well. Or great-grandfathers. Their father was a righteous man. Because of their great-great-great-great seventh time grandfather, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala looked after these orphans seven generations later. Because of a dead person. And they were righteous as well, these orphans. So how much you can benefit from a mu'min when you help them when they have died as well. We have run out of time. هذا وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين.